Hi, we're at the Myeloma 2018 meeting here in San Diego, and we've just had uh, two very exciting sessions uh, on a multiple myeloma progression, as well as one on epigenetics and myeloma. I'm Larry Boyce from Emory University, and I'm joined by two of our colleagues, um, Suzanne Lynch from Columbia University and Elizabeth Manasson. Manasson, excuse me, from uh, MD Anderson. And so Elizabeth was one of the speakers uh, in the last session on progression and talked to us a, a bit about the um, trials for treating uh, early myeloma, so smoldering myeloma. So um, can you tell us a little bit about what's really exciting now in these early uh, trials? Yeah, so as you correctly said, we are starting uh, to see in the field of uh, multiple myeloma that uh, if we treat a little bit earlier, we can actually get uh, very good uh, responses and very deep responses as well. And so as a field, we're trying to figure out what are the best patients to treat. And there are different markers that we can use. And depending on the studies, we have different, uh, you know, different markers and different models that we can use. Uh, usually, uh, we're focusing on uh, markers of tumor burden, such as the percentage of plasma cells and the bone marrow, what is the level of monoclonal protein in the blood and in the urine, and we can also focus on genetic markers of uh, plasma cells, for example. Some new studies are starting to uh, figure out also that the immune system is very important uh, for the progression uh, to multiple myeloma. And so there are some early studies uh, showing that maybe the loss or more expression of different markers may also induce progression. And so that may alter how we view this field in the future, although it's uh, still very early on. And, mm -hmm. and I so I think it's a very exciting field yeah. and your presentation was really well received because there's so much, I would say, insecurity. Should we treat patients with smoldering multiple myeloma or we should not? So um, I struggle with that question by myself. I'm following usually the expanded criteria of the International Myeloma Working Group. So if there's a question, if it is smoldering myeloma versus myeloma, I do the MRI at least of the pelvis and the spine and I follow the free light chains. Um, but how do you do that in, I, uh, in your institution? So do you treat we, we smoldering overall, only inside of clinical um, trials? Yeah, so smoldering myeloma, we only treat on clinical trials. Uh, we currently have a clinical trial using isatuximab, which is a CD38 antibody. So patients that elect to be treated and have high risk smoldering myeloma. And by the definition of a flow cytometry, or so advanced flow cytometry in the bone marrow, and also having uh, some hypo gamma globulinemia. So those patients are eligible if they want to. And the other ones, we just watch them. Um, I think that some of the studies that uh, I have talked about uh, are very interesting, and there are ongoing phase three studies with another CD38 antibody that are tumumab, and that. Uh, may give us an approval maybe uh, in smoldering myeloma for the first time, but this is still very early on to, to say. But that, yeah. that means we're not ready to treat smoldering myeloma despite the data. Right. Of we're not ready, no. Dr. Matthias. Right, and, and that was actually the mm -hmm. question. I think, I think we all, I think the concerns that Suzanne has about treatment are, are, are pretty well-founded in, mm -hmm. in, in the idea of over-treatment of patients mm -hmm. and, and, mm -hmm. and treating patients who are not actually, uh, you know, have um, symptoms of, of the disease that are there. So, so could you tell us a little bit more about why you think the advantages of being able to identify these patients for early treatment? So some of the advantages would be trying to treat a less complex myeloma. So we do have some studies in the literature showing that as a myeloma advances and there's more tumor burden, uh, patients in their myeloma have uh, more mutations, for example, making uh, the myeloma more difficult to treat or maybe more resistant to other treatments. So one of the potential advantages could be that you're treating a patient that has less tumor burden and less genomic complex myeloma. And so that emergence of resistance could be less, although you can also make the argument to the worst, the other side that you could be inducing resistance. And in the end, uh, we really have to wait for the clinical data. Uh, so far, the clinical data that we have and the only randomized study that I'm aware of, which was uh, lenalidomide and dexamethasone versus observation, that one showed that there was an advantage both in overall survival and time to progression to myeloma for the arm that was treated, although experts always think uh, that uh, there were some problems with that study in particular. 
Um, but I think that we're seeing this in other studies um, as well in terms of very deep responses. So the jury is still out in terms of what will happen in the future. Of course, as you said, uh, we're not treating a smoldering myeloma right now in the clinic unless it's a clinical trial. But they may, this may change in the next few years. I think one of the exciting things that came out is in addition to thinking about how to treat early disease is really, I think we have to learn about how disease progresses. And we had one talk uh, today about a, a mouse model of progression of myeloma and uh, they, where they used uh, genes that were involved in, uh, that we typically think about as myeloma oncogenes involved in this. Su Suzanne, did you, what did you think of, uh, of these, this model? I think it was a fascinating presentation. I was really uh, very excited to hear that, that he actually he developed the model in which he can follow uh, mouse developing uh, MGAS to smoldering myeloma to overt multiple myeloma. Um, this is what we need because we really don't have a good understanding at which stage uh, what happens exactly in terms of uh, transformation of the disease and also what is the best treatment. So I think this is for the first time a real mouse model that would help us to better understand and also to better treat the transition from MGAS smoldering to multiple myeloma. I was especially excited about the fact that he also saw amyloid in the organs. Uh, to, and uh, Dr. Cohen questioned that, uh, I don't think that we have any animal model right now developing amyloidosis. There's a model from um, the University of um, Boston. They developed the transgenic mice that in 70% uh, of the mice develop human amyloid over one year. But in this model, of each mice develops amyloid. That would be fantastic. Also to test new anti-amyloid drugs. No, I agree. I think the other thing that was exciting to me about it was actually dovetailed into to some comments you just made about, um, about the role of the immune system in, this, in these progression events. I think he had very uh, compelling data that, that there was a role for the immune system and, and how long it takes for the progression to occur. And so going after immune uh, approaches in these early things as you're doing is I think mm -hmm. going to be really, really exciting. I think that's great. The other part of this, of course, is that we have, the, in addition to the microenvironment and immune, is that there are going to be genetic and epigenetic in, events. And we had uh, uh, another session on the epigenetics of myeloma um, where we had a, a couple very exciting talks. Um, right. Do you want to comment yeah, on that? I had on, the on pleasure to chair the session about epigenetics. And um, just to go back in the history, I'm, we are we all were very excited by really strong scientific data on the role of epigenetic modifications in multiple myeloma. And um, we all were excited to have HDIC inhibitors, uh, for instance, like Panabinostat, and we're all very disappointed about the, I would say, low efficacy. And um, I'm not sure how often you're using Panabinostat in your practice. You know, I have to admit, I rarely use it. So it was a nice session today to show again very strong um, data uh, in epigenetics. Um, Dr. Brian Walker had an excellent presentation today in which he showed really the effect of um, structural changes uh, in the genome and the effects on, uh, on epigenetic modification. I think it was a very nice talk to show that uh, really structural changes affect the enhancers uh, and subsequently uh, the um, epigenetics. Um, Dr. Philippe Prosper showed very nice data how epigenetic modifications affect transcription factors, up or down regulation. So I think that was also a very nice um, scientific talk. Um, the problem what we have right now is we have really beautiful sciences, but to translate that into a clinical um, I would say improvement of the treatment of the patients. That's kind of you know the gap what we have right now. Maybe we have to find better ways, and that's what we also discussed um, to use, uh, for instance, HDIC inhibitors maybe earlier. Maybe we have to use it for patients with smoldering or MGAS, high risk MGAS. I mean, I'm very kind of you know provocative, but I think once you have really the structural damage of the cells. Um, clonal evolution, deletions, um, um, gain of, 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 um, gain of uh, chromosomes, it might be really difficult to modify really uh, the epigenetics kind of you know, expression of certain transcription factors. So maybe we did that too late uh, in multiple myeloma. 
And remember, most of the patients were heavily pretreated once they saw HDIC inhibitors. I think uh, the beauty of the HDIC inhibitors in multiple myeloma is that they synergize with the proteasome inhibitors. And I've had some success using the more stronger proteasome inhibitors, such as carfilzomib, with uh, agents uh, such as panovinostat. Although it is true that they're probably not as used in the clinic um, as we do use other medications. Yeah, so in summary, I think beautiful research is kind of you know, going on in terms of uh, what is the role of epigenetics in multiple myeloma and how can we use this for future treatment? Uh, yeah, I think you know, in, in thinking about Brian Walker's talk and showing really the molecular basis for how the translocation results in the activation of the gene really makes an, also an argument for further pursuing things like the bromo domain inhibitors. Is that, that since we can't right now target many of the genes that are translocated that he talked about, we don't have direct ways of targeting MYC or, or MAF or, or um, MM set, uh, but this may be a way of targeting the translocation uh, and, and looking at some of the modifiers that are involved in allowing that enhancer uh, to drive the, um, the expression of those mm -hmm. oncogenes. And so I think that might be a place where um, some of this work could ultimately uh, translate. But you're right, right now I think it was just elegant science. Yeah. yeah. Those are the exciting things that we heard today at uh, Myeloma 2018. Um, and so uh, thank you.